for this module today, we are going to discuss another important issue in free trade agreement, investment. Investment, uh, strictly speaking, is not an entirely new issue in international negotiations. It has been around as an item in international negotiations as part of the bilateral investment treaties, or BITs, which traditionally have been separate from free trade agreement and are mainly designed to uh, provide protection to the rights of investors when they go to another country to invest. But in recent decades, starting with the Canada, US, FTA and NAFTA, it has becoming more and more popular for countries to include investment as an issue in their free trade agreements. So by including investment as an issue in free trade agreements, in addition to providing investment protection, the investment chapters of the free trade agreements also provide for the liberalization of investment in key sectors by opening up sectors for foreign investment. So that is the added advantage of including investment in free trade agreements. Traditionally, investment was included in free trade agreements between developed and development countries, largely because of the distrust by the developed countries of the legal system in the developing countries. So when foreign investors come in, they are not sure that they are going to get the same level of justice that they get in their home country. That is why uh, there are investment uh, provisions in order to provide a safeguard that they might need before they can decide to invest in a country. But in recent years, the investment chapter has also become a common feature even in free trade agreements among developing countries, as many developed countries also start to invest overseas and they find out that uh, actually investment chapters is a very good tool that can help to protect their own investment. So that is why they also uh, embrace investment chapters in free trade agreements. So as we can see from this chart, the total number of provisions in investment chapter has been on a steady rise. And uh, you can uh, see especially a sharp rise uh, since the WTO came into being in 1995. And the reason for that is because the WTO uh, also included the General Agreement on Trading Services, or the GATS, which we discussed in another module. As we discussed in the other module, Guests include a form of supply. And most three is commercial presence, which is basically a form of investment. So that explains the popularity of investment as part of the free trade agreements since the WTO came into being. If you look at uh, all these uh, free trade agreements with uh, provisions on investment, you can see that uh, they uh, typically include issues such as the uh, scheduling approach uh, and many agreements are now taking the negative list approach. Uh, the uh, establishment rights for uh, the investors, acquisition uh, of the investment, post establishment rights for the investors, resale and investment protection, and also investor state arbitration mechanism or ISDS. So these are the common features of these uh, uh, investment chapters in the free trade agreements. And these are the main issues that we will discuss today. So the first issue we will discuss are the definitional issues. Definitional issues are very important because they really define, for example, what constitute investment, what constitute investor, all these uh, key issues uh, which must be first sorted out before we uh, deal with uh, uh, investment. So the first issue is the definition of investment. Investment, uh, if you think about it, could include either greenfield investment, that is a foreign investor comes in uh, 
build a factory on a green field. The factory uh, has never been used for industrial use before, and now a factory is built, so that is a totally new investment. Or alternatively, what you could have is the foreign investor acquiring an existing factory, either by directly taking over the factory or as a part of the portfolio investment. So uh, depending on the uh, structure of different agreements, as we can see, different types of um, uh, investment uh, chapters will take different approach. The example I give you here is quite uh, uh, expensive because uh, it includes many different types of investment. For example, it includes both movable and immovable property and other related property rights. It includes share, stock, debenture, and similar interests in companies. It includes the right to money or performance and the contract. It includes intellectual property rights. It includes goodwill, technical process, and know-how. It also includes uh, business concessions conferred by law or under contract, including the uh, right to extract or exploit law uh, oil and other uh, minerals. So if you look at the evolution of the definition of investment so far, you could see that initially countries took a broad approach as they wanted to attract FDI, foreign direct investment. So in the earlier uh, agreements, uh, they used the uh, so-called asset-based definition uh, and the coverage used uh, in these agreements basically covers every kind of asset, including both FDI and portfolio investment. But uh, as time went by, the definition of investment was subject not only to definitions in investment chapters in free trade agreements, but also to interpretation by the uh, arbitration panel in investor state dispute settlement cases. And in some of these cases, the panel's interpretation become problematic. For example, they uh, interpret the uh, foreign investment uh, in a way that is uh, in conflict or even contradictory to the definition and uh, the host state's domestic law. Now, this is uh, not surprising because these uh, uh, panelists in the arbitration panels are typically experts in international investment law, but they are not necessarily experts in the domestic law of the host country. So in such cases, uh, the parties uh, find that uh, such expensive uh, interpretation uh, really against their interests. That is why uh, there is uh, um, a drive by some countries to shift for a much narrower uh, enterprise-based uh, test. So uh, basically, uh, the idea is that uh, they uh, would uh, uh, comprise the establishment or acquisition of a business enterprise as well as a share that provides the investor control over an enterprise but it doesn't cover other stuff. So basically, the, the uh, approach is that we only want to protect the true investment, the investments where uh, the investor comes in and build a business enterprise uh, so as to uh, help our economy. And if you look at the approach uh, in the uh, FTAs with investment chapter now, you can see that nowadays, countries have uh, increasingly been trying to strike a balance between a comprehensive definition of investment and also, um, at the same time, try to avoid covering assets that they mean to exclude. So, um, these include uh, many different uh, techniques. For example, uh, the uh, would include in the uh, uh, investment chapter clause saying that uh, we would uh, uh, provide protection only to investments made in accordance with the host country law. 
So this solve the problem of a contradiction uh, with the host country law. Uh, and sometimes they also would use a closed list definition or an exhaustive definition instead of an open-ended um, or an illustrative definition. So only those investments which are included in the list are covered, but those which are not included are not covered. Uh, they could also exclude portfolio shares by restricting the asset-based approach to direct investment only. So uh, this means that the indirect investment, such as uh, the investment uh, done through portfolio investment, would not be covered. Uh, and some uh, of these agreements also uh, include uh, consideration of investment risk and other objective factors in order to determine when an asset uh, should be protected under the agreement. So the idea is that uh, uh, if you are an investor, you want to invest in another country, you have to uh, take on certain risk. Uh, investment always comes with a risk. If your loss is caused by the inherent risk of the investment, for example, because you didn't do proper market research, uh, or because of uh, some um, uh, financial problems uh, in uh, the firm uh, or because of some uh, internal issues in management of the firm, then this should not uh, be regarded as uh, a kind of a failure to protect the investment and the subject to the investor state uh, arbitration uh, mechanism. They could also exclude certain types of assets, which uh, would include, for example, certain commercial contracts, loans and debt securities, and assets used for non-business purposes. So if you compare this with the definition earlier, you can see that uh, some of the items on, in the definition, for example, the rights which uh, 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 arise from a contract might not be covered by some of these uh, uh, investment chapters. Uh, you could also use a more selective approach to intellectual property rights as protected assets. So in other words, not recognizing intellectual property rights like patents uh, as a part of investment because it's highly controversial as to whether or not uh, things such as patents could be uh, included as uh, 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 in investment. And also uh, dealing with a special problem of defining the investment in the case of a complex group enterprises as investors. So uh, if you have, a, uh, you know, like a, a group company and a subsidiary company, sometimes this might not be covered uh, in the definition of investment. So uh, these are all the attempts by the host country in order to solve the problem associated with an overly broad definition of investment. The second issue is the definition of person. Okay, So um, investors are defined as persons from uh, the, uh, uh, the uh, covered, uh, from the uh, uh, covered countries of the uh, free trade agreement uh, which uh, would go to another country to invest. But what do we mean by persons? Uh, legally speaking, there are two different types of persons. The first one would be a natural person, which is easy to understand. So a private individual who is a citizen uh, of, uh, um, uh, of a party to the free trade agreement. The second type would be legal person or a juridical person. So how do you determine who is a juridical person? I mean, um, in the case of a natural person, that is relatively easy. If you are a citizen, then you are protected. But sometimes there could be problems, uh, um, uh, for example, uh, if uh, uh, you, are, uh, you have a dual citizenship, um, uh, for example, then this could create a problem. And in some agreement, uh, uh, if you have a dual citizenship, uh, then uh, this might uh, cause a problem in terms of uh, claiming the benefit and uh, the investment chapter. Uh, and another uh, issue uh, with regard to the natural person is uh, 
Even if you are not a national, uh, even if you are not a citizen, if you are permanent rep, uh, a resident of a party, sometimes uh, that is also covered, especially for jurisdictions like uh, Hong Kong or Singapore, which are trying to encourage people to set up shop there, so uh, they might be taking a broad definition to natural person. Now, uh, with regard to legal person or juridical person, the uh, uh, nationality of the legal person is typically decided by the place of registration of the investor. So if you are um, registered in the U U.S., you will be regarded as uh, uh, a U.S. investor. If you are registered in Singapore, you will be regarded as a Singapore investor. But sometimes this could raise problems. For example, uh, if you just uh, if you see that one country uh, concluded a free trade agreement, which include investment chapter with another country that you want to uh, invest in, you could just go to that country and pay the registration fee and register as a company. Uh, but without having any substantive um, operation in such a country. So in such a case, if you do not have uh, any so-called real economic activity or substantial business activities, in uh, this country, should you be regarded as uh, 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 in, uh, as an investor from that country? So, um, as we can see here, for example, in the uh, Singapore, India, SIPA, uh, 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 as we can see uh, in the investment chapter, they have taken a cautious approach by requiring the investor to have a substantial business operation. Okay, uh, if you do not have a substantial business operation, then uh, you might not be regarded as an investor from this country, and uh, then uh, you might be denied the benefit. Another uh, issue with regard to denial of a benefit uh, is the case of investors whose home states do not maintain diplomatic relations with the host state or preventing. Uh, third country nationals who own a country uh, the uh, uh, control the investors from gaining access to protection from a treaty to which they are not uh, a party. So uh, as we can see the second scenario that is the investors of the denying party own or control the enterprises already stated in this example here. But how about investors whose home state do not maintain diplomatic relationship with the host state? So this could be situations like an investor, uh, let's say, uh, from Taiwan, uh, which uh, do not have diplomatic relations with many countries, and that could be a difficult issue. Uh, and unless you have the provision, this could sometimes cause a problem. So that is another common provision contained in uh, these uh, investment uh, uh, chapters. The next issue is with regard to the so-called SMBD, Senior Management and the Board of uh, Directors. So uh, here the idea is that uh, if you really want to welcome investment from another country, you should not impose restrictions on the nationality requirements on uh, the senior management and the board of directors for uh, such invested entity uh, because uh, having such a requirement uh, would cause a problem with the investment. Uh, imagine that you are a U.S. investor who want to invest in Singapore and you come to Singapore and you are told that you have to uh, appoint Singaporeans as your uh, senior management and the board of directors this might dissuade you from uh, investing at all. So this is another uh, provision that is becoming increasingly common. So unless the parties explicitly state for a given sector that they want to make sure uh, that um, there must be a minimum number of um, senior management and uh, directors who are uh, of the uh, nationality of the host country, then you cannot maintain uh, such restrictions.
The next issue is what constitute measures affecting investment. Now,、uh, this is also another key issue because,、uh, in an investor state arbitration, the subject would be measures affecting investment. And here, as we can see from this example, measures mean any measure by a party, whether in the form of a law, regulation, rule, procedure, decision. Administrative action or any other form, and include measures taken by central, regional, or local government and authorities, and non-governmental bodies in the exercise of powers delegated by central, regional, or local government or authorities. So the idea here is twofold.、Uh, first of all,、uh, it should be some sort of、uh, law or some sort of a government、uh, action which、uh, would affect the investment. And second,、uh, it must be、uh, by an authorized entity. Such authorized entity could be government authority, and by government we mean both the central government and the local government. Now,、uh, free trade agreements are typically signed by the central government of a country, but this does not mean that the local government are not subject to obligation under the free trade agreement. Uh, the answer is、uh, yes. They are also subject to、um, the uh, obligation under the free trade agreement because the uh, are um, uh, um, uh, they are subject to the obligation、uh, because the、uh, central government has signed this、uh, international treaty. And second, this could also include uh, uh, non-governmental bodies which exercise government power. So,、uh, in some countries, some of the sectors are subject to regulation by、uh, non-governmental bodies. For example, in many countries, the、uh, regulation of lawyers would uh, be uh, uh, regulated by the law society or the lawyers association. These are not really governmental bodies, but they have the power to regulate the legal profession to approve. Uh, or uh, reject the application for legal practice,、uh, in the host country, and、uh, their measure would also be regarded as a measure affecting an investment. The next issue is、uh, provisions relating to investment liberalization. Now, here, as we can see,、uh, the provisions mainly constitute、uh, the scheduling of investment commitments. And also,、uh, the national treatment and MFN obligations on、uh, investment, which we will tackle one by one. So first of all,、uh, when you look at market access for investment, the first question that would come to mind would be,、uh, which、uh, listing approach would you use? Would you use a positive listing approach, uh, like uh, in the gas? Uh, uh, the general agreement on trading services of the WTO, or a negative listing approach like the TPP.、Uh, as I mentioned earlier, in recent years,、uh, negative listing has becoming more and more popular, especially in the agreements concluded by the U.S.、Uh, with other countries. So, with the negative listing approach, it is very different from the positive listing approach. For the positive listing approach. What you do is that、uh, you include a schedule which lists the sectors that you are willing to liberalize, and any restrictions therein. But negative listing approach is very different.、Uh, here, the default rule is that、uh, unless a sector is listed in、uh, the schedule of non-conforming measures and reservations, you are, are presumed to liberalize the sector, and、uh, you cannot maintain any restrictions. So, if you want to maintain any restrictions, you must make sure that you understand the regulatory status quo, and you must make sure that、uh, you list them either as non-conforming measures, which are existing measures which do not conform with one of your obligations, such as national treatment or most favored nation treatment, or you will list them as reservations, which reserve your right to regulate to introduce more restrictions. Uh, on top of the existing restrictions in the future, and these investment uh, uh, liberalization provisions sometimes uh, might uh, overlap with the services commitments. Uh, 
Uh, I mean, um, in uh, most of the cases, the investment provisions are regarded as mutually exclusive uh, compared to the services provisions. But uh, in the case of a commercial presence, commercial presence is both a mode of supply for provision of services and also a mode of investment. So uh, it is a special case here. And here you could have an overlapping between services and investment provisions. And in these cases, uh, you need to check both the service chapter and the investment chapter to make sure that uh, there are no restrictions. So uh, when you look at the investment liberalization uh, for the uh, national treatment um, uh, uh, restrictions, um, uh, basically the agreement uh, look at whether um, national treatment is provided, for example, for the uh, pre-establishment phase uh, or just uh, for a post-establishment phase. The same applies to the MFN provision. Uh, so the question is whether it applies only to pre-establishment or post-establishment. Uh, these issues we will discuss in more detail later. So uh, let's first of all look at um, uh, one uh, uh, another issue regarding uh, investment protection. So here, uh, for investment protection, as you can see, um, these include uh, several issues: uh, MFN, national treatment, expropriation, uh, and also fair and equitable uh, treatment or FET. So uh, expropriation a used to be the main problem uh, facing uh, investors when they invest in another country. Here, uh, expropriation refer to uh, the uh, taking of assets of the investor uh, or seizure of the assets of the investor uh, by uh, the government. Uh, by the government. So. Um, Many agreements uh, provide for the um, um, right of investors against expropriation. And as you can see from this example that I included here, uh, as you can see in Article 1, uh, you cannot take any measure of expropriation against the investment of investors of the other party unless the measures are taken on a non-discriminatory basis for a purpose authorized by law in accordance with due process of law and against the payment of a compensation. So uh, as you can see here, uh, the taking uh, or expropriation of uh, asset of an investor is not allowed unless you fulfill all of these uh, four conditions. First of all, it must be for a public purpose. Let's say that the government want to build a road or the government want to designate uh, this area where the factory is located as a reserve area. Uh, uh, unless this is for those public purpose, you cannot take the asset. And second, it must be carried out in a non-discriminatory uh, manner, which means that you cannot just uh, uh, take the properties of the foreign investor without uh, also uh, sees the properties of the local investor who are similarly uh, situated. And three, in accordance with uh, some kind of uh, due process. And uh, due process is uh, uh, very important because that is what the investors uh, uh, worry about most when they go to a foreign country. So an uh, investor comes from U.S. In the U.S., they have the rule of law. Uh, and they can be guaranteed that uh, the legal process would be uh, fair and just. But when they go to a foreign country, uh, the legal system is, um, uh, is uh, uh, incomplete. And um, uh, there are many processes of the law which are not followed or which are absent. So this would cause problems when the investors are trying to protect this right. And of course, um, with uh, payment, uh, of full compensation for the value of the expropriated uh, asset. And uh, this usually is uh, specified as of the date of the expropriation, often with more details regarding acceptable value techniques and interests. 
So um, uh, the determination of how much is the full compensation of the value of the asset is a tricky issue. Uh, so uh, you could argue that um, once the government decided to uh, take the asset, the asset would become uh, worthless, would lose or lose a big chunk of its value. So should you use that as the basis? No. Uh, the idea is that uh, you should use the uh, value of the asset without taking into account the uh, taking or the expropriation by the government because otherwise the investors would get very little of their investment uh, value uh, back. The next issue is uh, the minimum standard of treatment. So the minimum standard of treatment uh, is something very interesting. Just look at its face. You might think that is the lowest possible uh, level of a treatment. Uh, that is the lower than national treatment. But if you uh, read the jurisprudence or if you look in detail the meaning of the minimum standard of a treatment, you can see that uh, actually the minimum standard of a treatment is uh, something that is higher than national treatment. So um, uh, it applies on top of national treatment. Uh, the idea is that uh, the national treatment in developing countries uh, often are not sufficient to provide sufficient uh, justice to the investors. Instead, we would uh, want to include additional protection, which would include, for example, fair and equitable treatment. What do we mean by fair and equitable treatment? Now, these are fair and equitable treatment uh, uh, that are based on the legal system of the home country of the investor rather than the host country uh, of a place of investment. So uh, this would include, for example, the obligation not to deny justice in criminal, civil, or administrative or judici uh, judiciary, uh, adjudicatory proceedings in accordance with the principles of due process embodied in the principal legal system of the, of the world. So what are the principal legal system of the world? The two main legal systems are the civil law system and common law system. And if you look at the state of investor state of arbitration, actually many uh, leading uh, investor uh, arbitration lawyers are American lawyers. So um, uh, uh, naturally they would apply U.S. law as the basis for uh, the due process. And uh, that would mean that uh, the investor would typically be getting much better protection than the one that they would find uh, under the national legal system uh, of the host state. Uh, second type would include a full protection and a security. So uh, here the idea is that uh, you would provide the level of police protection required under customs uh, international law. So. Uh, this means that um, the investors would actually get better protection again uh, than the local investors because local investors typically cannot claim uh, the uh, level of uh, privacy protection uh, as under customs international law. Again, customs international law is shaped uh, mainly by the practice of a uh, uh, developed country rather than developed country, so that would elevate the level of protection available to the investors. Uh, in addition to minimum standard of treatment, uh, we also have national treatment. So national treatment is uh, similar to the national treatment provision and the WTO. The idea is that uh, your treatment uh, should not be less favorable than the treatment provided to uh, the local investor. Uh, but uh, uh, unlike the WTO uh, national treatment um, uh, provision, which only applies to products. So if you look at, for example, the WTO agreement um, uh, article uh, the, uh, 3 of the GET, for example, that only covers the products. It doesn't cover the producers of the products. Uh, but in the case of investment chapters, national treatment are also extended to investors and investments. So in terms of the scope of the national treatment obligation, uh, they uh, mostly cover the post-establishment phase. 
that is the management, conduct, operation, liquidation, sale, and transfer or other disposition of the investments. But in recent years, it has become more and more popular for investment chapters in free trade agreements to include the so-called pre-establishment rights. Uh, for example, the right with regard to establishing acquisition or expansion of investment. The idea is that um, uh, you should not discriminate uh, uh, even against the foreign investors at the time that uh, they are considering investment, uh, at the time that they are applying to, uh, to uh, establish investment in your country, because otherwise um, they could just be shut out uh, of the uh, uh, local market uh, permanently. So in terms of the treatment standards, as I mentioned earlier, uh, these would be no less favorable than uh, the most favorable local treatment. So local investors might be subject to, the, uh, to dif different levels of treatment, and the best one uh, must be provided to the uh, foreign investor. And uh, national treatment is also defined to include compensation for losses suffered in war and civil strife. Uh, so again, as you can see, that is something that uh, the local investors do not necessarily uh, get. The next issue is uh, uh, transfer of uh, profits or capital. Uh, in principle, this should be guaranteed to uh, the foreign investors uh, uh, as a matter of a right, but there could be exceptions. For example, uh, uh, as you can see from this example here, a party could prevent a transfer through the equitable, non-discriminatory, and good faith application of laws relating to bankruptcy, to issuing uh, securities, to criminal offenses, uh, to ensure the satisfaction of judgments, uh, and also for uh, social security uh, grants, uh, like pension funds, uh, and so on. So uh, if these are the obligations that the investor has not uh, fulfilled, then uh, the country might impose restrictions on the transfer of, uh, transfer of profits or capital out of the country. So they have to satisfy these obligations before they can transfer the uh, profits or capital uh, out of the country. Uh, the last type of issue are uh, uh, social uh, and regulatory uh, goals in the investment chapter. Uh, as you can see, uh, it is uh, quite common for investment chapters to include a provision relating to social goals or the right to regulate. Social goals would include, first of uh, for protection of the environment, which is very popular, and second, also uh, protection of labor rights and human rights, and third, uh, corporate social responsibility, and fourth, various uh, sustainable development um, uh, objectives, uh, which could include, for example, gender balance, uh, the social uh, equality issues, and so on. And also, uh, many uh, investment chapters also include uh, a general right to regulate so uh, these reflect the tension between attracting investment on the one hand and making sure that the host country would retain the right to regulate on the other hand. Uh, of course, we want to encourage foreign investment, but when the foreign investors come in, uh, they do not come in uh, with uh, uh, unlimited rights. Uh, that are beyond the regulations of uh, national laws. If we want to, for example, enact laws which protect our environment and the foreign investor uh, uh, starts a heavily polluting factory, of course, the foreign investor should be liable. And this should not be grounds for the foreign investor to claim uh, the um, uh, compensation uh, from the investor arbitration, investor state arbitration mechanism. Many investor ch uh, investment chapter also include exceptions clauses. So exception clauses could include uh, provisions relating to the general exception, that is to protect the environment, to protect the human, animal, plant life or health, protect the exhaustible natural resources, protect the public moral, uh, and so on. Uh, 
Uh, and these provisions also include uh, explicit clauses referring to the consideration of a public interest. And another type of security, uh, another type of exception clause is referred to security exception. So uh, these would be uh, the measures taken on national security grounds. And uh, these actually correspond to the rise of investment security reviews that is becoming increasingly popular in the Western country. In uh, US, for example, in EU, Australia, and so on, they all have various investor security reviews in order to prevent sensitive sectors from falling into the hands of hostile uh, foreign uh, states. And last but certainly not least, we also have investor state dispute arbitration or uh, ISDA. So ISDA uh, a provide institutional safeguard for the substantive obligations by allowing the foreign investors to challenge in an independent arbitration panel the practices of the host state. But there are sometimes conditions before an investor can invoke an ISDA. Uh, so uh, some of the uh, investor chapters would require the consent of the host country before investor state arbitration could be invoked. Uh, but nowadays, uh, many uh, host states, in order to, uh, um, in order to um, uh, attract investment, uh, uh, include uh, this as an automatic uh, 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 mechanism in the investment chapter, which means that you do not require the uh, consent or uh, they already give the consent when they sign up for the free trade agreement. And some agreement also requires the exhaustion of local remedies. That is because uh, the investor state arbitration mechanism could be quite costly, uh, could be uh, millions of dollars at least uh, for the governments involved. So they would prefer the investors to uh, at least first try to use the local remedies like the local cost, local judicial system and only if that doesn't work, then resort to uh, ISDS. Uh, in terms of the scope of investor state arbitration, some uh, agreement would limit this only to the amount of uh, expropriation, but some agreement would expand it to uh, also include the decision of whether or not to uh, expropriate the foreign asset uh, rather than just the amount. The arbitral panel is set up with three arbitrators, with one each nominated by the investor and the host state, and then the chair by mutual agreement. In terms of uh, applicable law, uh, there is also a debate as to whether we should only apply the law of the host country or general rules of international law. And actually, the latter approach, that is the general rules of international law, seems to be a prevailing approach taken by arbitration panels these days. And that is understandable because if you really trust the national law, then uh, there's no reason why you should seek investor state arbitration. Uh, in recent years, because of uh, some of the abuses of investor state arbitration, uh, there has been a backlash against uh, investor state arbitration in uh, some countries. For example, uh, in the Australia uh, plain packaging case, Philip Morris uh, basically uh, sought arbitration against uh, Australia when Australia required them to have a plain packaging of the cigarettes. And the, um, uh, the BIT it used was the Hong Kong Australia BIT. Even though Philip Morris was not really a Hong Kong company, it was an American company, but it used its Hong Kong subsidiary uh, uh, to claim uh, the right as investors under the BIT. And that is regarded by uh, some countries as being um, abuse of the uh, investor state arbitration process. So there has been a new wave of um, a reflection on the investor state arbitration process with the result that even many developed countries now start to have a second thoughts about the investor state arbitration process and are reluctant to include such provisions in their free trade agreements, uh, investment chapters, or in BITs. So to conclude, as we can see here, 
Uh, investment is、uh, a very interesting issue because on the one hand you can see that countries all compete against each other to try to attract investment, but on the other hand, when the foreign investors come in, we want to make sure that the foreign investors、uh, bring in benefit to the economy and also follow our laws, do not really unduly interfere with the um uh, uh the um. Uh, power of the local government to regulate, to enact proper, uh, regulation that reflect proper public policy considerations. So this is reflected in the different provisions which we discussed earlier, and uh, uh, reflecting these different considerations, we can see that there are different approaches, uh, taken by the countries from the uh definition. Of investment、uh, to which types of uh, um, uh, taking or expropriation are subject to dispute settlement,、uh, to the design of the dispute settlement system, and so on. Now,、uh, here is is hard to see、uh, which approach is the best approach,、uh, because different countries have different、uh, backgrounds. So here, all I could see is that the best approach. Is the one that would advance your national interest best. So,、uh, before you can、uh, decide which type of approach you want for various provisions, as I discussed earlier, you have to first of all conduct a thorough analysis of your national interest, and then this could be used to design uh, the uh, investment chapters in your free trade agreements. So that concludes this presentation.、Uh, thank you very much.